Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we're honored to be with you today. Um, moving from uh, the State of the Union to um, a topic that is um, also very topical and very interesting. Um, and it is about connecting about women and connecting with women from the grassroots. And um, looking at the, um, we're going to discuss stories of victimizations and stories of hope, stories of empowerment and agency. Um, today, we're honored to have with us um, Victoria Nyanjura. Victoria, she was one of the uh, 139 women who were uh, abducted by the LRA in the 1996. She spent eight years in captivity, um, and um, she's now an aftercare specialist, the organization uh, International Justice Mission, and she is a member of the Women Advocacy Network, um, and I know one of my friends also is part of that organization, who is Evelyn Amoni, who um, was also um, experienced um, similar experience. So, uh, Victoria today, she's going to talk to us about her inspirational work, and she's going to talk about her experience, and I'm hoping we're going to learn from her, and I think that um, what we're going to learn today will give us the courage and the hope to keep going and to fight uh, injustices all over the world. Um, our second speaker is Harriet Lamb, who is the CEO of International Alert. It's one of the, I mean, I think it's the biggest UK international NGO, and they are present in over 20 countries all over the world, and they do an amazing work in terms of um, uh, women, women leadership, women participations, and improving the conditions of women you know, in, in those countries where they work. And they do also fantastic work on gender-based violence. So uh, we're going to start by Victoria. The floor is yours. We're all listening. Thank you so much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so honored to be here. I thank Rising Global Peace Forum for inviting me to be here today. Had they not done so, you never know, I wouldn't share my story with the world. I must appreciate Afrinspire, the UK charity organization that has been working hand in hand to ensure that I get a visa and they are hosting me in their home. I cannot forget to thank International Justice Mission for allowing me to be in the UK for this conference. In a, spe in a special way, allow me to thank Marion Maxellian, she's from Coventry University. She met me in a simple research. We sat under a veranda. I didn't know it would lead to this, giving me an opportunity to share my story. If wherever you are, I'm grateful for what you did to me. I will share my story briefly. As she said, I happened to be one of the girls who were abducted in 1996 from St. Mary's College, Aboke, at the age of 14. Uh, 109 girls were released, 30 of us re were retained by the rebels. I cannot go deep into all the details, but all I have to say is, when people sit here and talk of the war, let us take heart to discuss real issues the way it has been here. I sat, I listened, and I told myself, I wish some of these things were done before. And I request it is something that we should really embark on. When they talk of rebel, rebels, then there is pain. You can imagine walking away, you know you have no voice at all. Somebody is taking you, you have to follow. I was at school like any normal child would be. Then rebels walked away with me. It did not end at that. We had to carry heavy luggage. We were beaten. I saw how our friends were being released, just crying because they were leaving. It was the beginning of everything. They were, we were beaten. Before I could realize it, we just sat the way we are seated. A man is speaking, you, you have to be the wife. I'd never known, no man had even ever tried approaching me for love. 
but I had to know it in such a situation. Young as I was, I had to produce. There's nothing. When they talk of rebel, of course, you, they are also ever in a hiding. There is no formal place of staying. You give birth. There is no, any, no medical support in any way. So as we see it, some women are back home. Very many are affected with their reproductive system, the pain of what we went through, and a lot of things continue to happen. Allow me also, like say, sometimes when things happen in life, it is important not to give up in life. Eight years in captivity, God helped me. I returned back home. I escaped. In, 19, in 2004, there was serious war in Sudan. The government of Uganda happened to follow its rebels, the LRI, Lord's Resistance Army, fighting them back so that they could really defeat them in, the, in their own country. That is when I made my way back home. When I reached home, at first I thought like that was all. Little did I know that after some times, there are now things that continue to affect you. As I saw my father, the first day he saw me, only tears rolled on his face. Then I told myself, Victoria, should you ever cry? People, men don't cry in most cases, but the tears on my father's face told me that I should never make them see any tears on my face. Because he cried before I could even open my mouth to tell him something. And my mother looked on. We went home. I saw how people were coming to see me. Not everyone. There are people who will come to see. Is she really the human being? We knew. People talk of like if somebody has stayed with the rebels, the characters are totally different. Others are stigmatizing. Others are feeling pity for you. I listened to all that people were saying. Then I asked myself, what bad thing can you ever do to yourself? I said, no. If I have the opportunity, I need to go back to school. Why did I have to think of going back to school? One, I was taken at a time I really needed to study. But I did not live to achieve what I'd wanted in life. So I told my father, I know you may not be able to pay me, but if at all I get an opportunity that any organization is offering to pay me, I will go back to school. He asked me, are you able to listen to the teacher and understand something? I told him I will try my level best, but let me go back to school. Why? First of all, I wanted to continue with what I'd left on the way. Two, I felt I would be busy, and then I wouldn't have the time to overthink of certain things. Indeed, an NGO came. They offered to pay me at school. The beginning was not easy. As you see, like these days, children study when they are so young. I look at myself, I had skin rashes and what. Kids are trying to laugh, asking themselves, really, what, what is this one looking for here? I said, no, I will be. So after sometimes two years down the road, I failed, but I told myself, be at school. In the end, I started passing. Until in 2013, when I completed a bachelor's degree in development studies, then I asked myself, as I go back and interact, how many of the women we suffered with are able, have made it to where I am? I saw that totally. The majority could not even try to come close. I told myself, no. Go back where these women are staying. I went back to Gulu. I started staying in Gulu. We have our network. These women had already started. They meet on their own and discuss, tell their stories, but there was no message of hope because whom can you talk to? People are having discussions. Sometimes even the ongoing discussions are in English. There is nobody to, 
try and bring out the issues. Then I said, okay, I'm here. We started a women's advocacy network in an informal sitting the way we are now, where you talk about the challenges, the pain you went through, how you feel. The other one will talk. Jen will talk. Later we realize these stories help you. If you repeat it time and again, there is that healing yet that you start realizing. There is somebody listening to you. Sometimes I thought I was the one who suffered more, yet Jen, somewhere, there was a day she suffered in that I feel at least my suffering for Jen was more. So women started realizing the importance of the storytelling. Then we sat down and said, people might say they don't know real about the challenges which we suffered. Why can't this be put down in form of a document? We requested an organization to help us out. We piled a petition on the challenges, on the issues of the children that we returned with from captivity, how they are demanding for identity, the need for these children to go to school, the medical assistance that is really required, psychosocial support. Even if we tell the stories and you get the form of healing, it is not enough. Other areas need real experts to talk to you, and then you fail somehow. We petitioned the Parliament of Uganda through the women parliamentarians. We thought going through the women they would even be able to understand us better and then present the issues like mothers of the nation. Indeed, they accepted our petition. We were called. I sat as the issues were being discussed in parliament. I would see all. In Uganda, we have different political parties. They all embraced the issues that we brought on children, ourselves, and what... What surprised me is a resolution was passed on how some of these issues should be achieved in 2014. Today is 2017. I sit here to talk. Up to now, nothing has ever been done. The war has ended because the guns are silent in northern Uganda no more. But it has not ended because corn is not in Uganda. Currently, we know he's in Central African Republic, implying what we suffered, the women in Central African Republic continue to go through. But what about the women in Northern Uganda that returned and they are no longer hearing the guns? Priorities keep changing. The beginning, there is the trauma. People are talking about these women should be looked into. Their rights have to be uplifted. As we discuss here, I really want to understand also, it is not easy as yesterday when we heard of the keynote. There are challenges in life. If you really have it in you, you cannot survive well, and the pain does not move away in you. Children have grown. They have to go to school. But here is a poor woman who was taken minus even going to school, she has returned, she cannot go back to school and start from anywhere. No access to land. Even a little capital to at least start something small that you can do on your own to make you be able to provide food for your children. I appreciate there is uni universal primary education, which is in Uganda, but when you look at the content, it's also not good. The name is there children go, and after that you cannot proceed anymore. So you really feel the pain when a woman come and tell you if there is anybody in that next door who would want me to wash for him or her the clothes. Let me come and wash. I need money for something. Sometimes you feel and then you say, the world is not fair to some, to some people. But at the end of the day, we are saying no. Continue to have hope. We are continuing to advocate for the same issues. Even in Uganda itself, we involve the local leaders at the national level. But then people start appreciating all the war affected the whole region. There is a difference between somebody who lost totally 
And then the one who at least had the clothes and had something small is trying to do something small to earn a living. This one who returns without anything and you have to survive. We are not the same. There is me who my parents accepted me. Then another one, the parents rejected her because of fear of responsibility. They also don't have the way in the camps. Now the best is struggle on your own as I also struggle to survive. As I sit here, we are starting to say, let us start looking at the simplest way of starting to address the issues that we have. We might, wait, we might have hope, but others will die minus re realizing the reality in life. And we started say, on our own, we shall continue to spread the gospel, advocate any simple organization, whether there is a simple program. If you really have medical support in a specific line, let us know. Whether two or five women benefit from it, we appreciate. Anybody dealing in livelihood, be it agriculture, you're supporting. If you happen to reach Eastern Uganda, Uganda, Northern Uganda, we are there. Offer anything that you feel it is in line with what you're doing. Honestly, the situation is not good, but I acknowledge the gun is silent, no more fighting. But the effect of the war, what pains most is a child suffering to ask you, but where is my, parent, my father? How can you talk about a man? First of all, you don't know they are home. If he died, that is all. You'd love to leave it at that. But when you tell a child your father died, he will say, you mean even the people are not there? These are men who use different names for fear of their families being followed up. You cannot start from anywhere. So the identity of these children will be a serious threat in a nearby future to come. Of recent, I was in a conference in Kampala, our capital city. I told them, we are not like advocating for insecurity, but the fact on ground is, thousands of women returned with children. These children are growing. If I don't have identity, first of all, no father, I'm not going to school, what do they lose? A child will one day, think of whether I do what it is not a loss on my side and can easily do anything. It can be a threat to the region where we are coming for, from. It can be a threat to the whole country at large, but seeing what the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army did itself, it has not affected only Northern Uganda. It went to Southern Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo. Four countries have been affected. I sat there and my heart was bleeding with pain to hear what is happening in Syria. What do people think? Can't we really have a heart of forgiving and then thinking towards something positive? There is a lot to be admired. War is bad. As we sit to discuss peace and reconciliation, let us commit ourselves towards it. Otherwise, it is something that is bad that you live to re you remain with it. You remain with it, and then it lives to haunt you forever, and it affects the generation to come. Today we sit here. Let's go back to our different offices, countries, and start a different agenda on what we should do for peace. Of recent, I saw Nigerian girls coming back. A party was done, and I asked myself, I remember BBC called me, and I just told them, I hope it's not ending with the party. They should look beyond that party. That is to show them we have accepted you. But what is the long-term plan on how this girl's life should be restored? And it shouldn't be only on the 21 girls who have returned because they were at school. They should mine of all the different people who are returning from captivity if we are to look into peace. Thank you. I beg to stop here.
Thank you, Victoria, for, for this uh, incredibly touching um, story uh, and inspirational journey that you had. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, before uh, we, I ask you some questions and we draw on the experiences, and we're going to listen to um, Harriet Lam, who is talking, uh, moving from um, Uganda to Nigeria, and she's going to talk about the Boko Haram girls. And I'm sure there are very similarities in terms of living in captivity, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. And can I first pay huge respect to you? for your experience, but also your incredible spirit that you've come through with. And I think to pick up on your point on what should be on our agenda for peace, I think very high up the list should be the role of amazing women like Victoria as peace builders. And the ability uh, of women like yourself to really build that everyday peace on the ground, which you so strongly highlighted that although Uganda may have come out of the guns may be silent, the need to build that everyday peace is more important than ever. And also that women need to be much more at the peace table. It is one of the shocking facts that only 10% of the people who sit around the tables negotiating peace deals are women. And yet all the figures prove that the more women are involved in the peace deals, the longer those deals will last. And so I think making sure that amazing women like you are supported and able to play your part must be right up there on our agenda for peace. And I think you really highlighted the second point of that agenda for peace must also be about giving particular care and attention to all those, but in particular women and girls who have been abused in war. And as you mentioned, we recently saw the release and everyone was, of course, cheering at the release of 21 of the 276 Chibok girls who were kidnapped in northeast Nigeria. And that's uh, an area where International Alert as a charity has been doing some work. Uh, and in our work, we've found exactly what you're saying, that in fact, firstly, 276 Chibok girls made famous by the Bring Back Our Girls campaign are just a few of the well over 2,000 girls who have been kidnapped in northeast Nigeria. And as uh, the Nigerian military has pushed north and has been liberating areas from Boko Haram, they have been releasing some of the other, among those 2,000 women and girls. And at first there is indeed cheering, as you say, but in fact for far too many of those women and girls, uh, that is far from the end of their ordeal. Because what we found uh, in our research with those women is they're then taken to internally displaced people's camps. And it's something most people don't know that actually now in northeast Nigeria is the third largest humanitarian crisis in the world. And so thousands and millions actually of people are living in these camps. And when they get to those camps, the women and girls actually find they're then rejected by their very own communities, rejected by their husbands or rejected indeed by their own families because people feel and fear that they have been infected by Boko Haram. That people see in them, as one woman said, I was labelled as a Boko Haram wife with a dark soul. They thought I was evil. Because people feared that they would come back believing what Boko Haram believes in. And even worse, their children were being rejected as having bad blood that people actually said uh, the child of a snake is a snake and that they feared even more the children than the women. And so we started working exactly as you say, Victoria, to do that work to overcome the stigma that those women have endured. Firstly, to support them to talk about what they've been through together. But absolutely critically in all the work we do with women is always to also talk to the men 
and to the whole community. And it was indeed by sitting down and talking with the men that many of the husbands then, then said, oh yes, I see now, it wasn't my wife's fault and I'm very happy to take her back. Indeed, there was one story of a man who was just on the point of getting married to someone else when his first wife came back and in the end, he recognized the importance of standing by her and indeed the children she had now newly brought back with her. And in that uh, process of talking with the community about the issues and enabling the community to accept people, very critical was also the role of religious leaders, which I think goes to our earlier discussion today about faith and fear, that actually it was both Christian and Muslim religious leaders who came out and spoke about the texts of forgiveness that then actually also gave validity to the community to embrace those women and girls back. And I have to say, there are also increasing incidents of men and boys coming back who face even worse situation, particularly if they have been sexually abused themselves or if people feel they have fought with the Boko Haram. And so again, the importance of working with all people, including the men and boys, and in particularly when they're coming back and making sure that the whole community uh, is ready and able to receive them, whereas people often reject them and actually there have even been fears that they're going to murder people in the community and they want to push them out of the camps. Also, as Victoria said, is the absolute critical importance of people having livelihoods. And without that, m many of those women have found themselves having to go into prostitution as the only way that they can earn a livelihood. So it's equally critical is that we're able to provide livelihoods to those people. And I think that points to some of the enormous complexities of how best can we support people who, as, 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 as for example, coming out of, in that case, having been uh, abducted by Boko Haram and the complexities of that. And in a way that raises some of the challenges I think we can wrestle with, with something like the campaign of Bring Back Our Girls. Because obviously that was an incredibly successful campaign in one way. It managed to put the spotlight on those 276 Chibok girls who had been abducted to make sure that they weren't forgotten. And that wasn't just a social media campaign, that was people in Nigeria knocking day in, day out on the doors of the government. They even run a 24-hour continuous vigil with the parents pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure that the girls are not forgotten. And because then, of course, the campaign was taken up and it went viral and you had people like Michelle Obama also tweeting bring back our girls and what that did was then get the attention of uh, the international community and it was indeed the International Red Cross and the Swiss government who then got involved and helped negotiate some of the uh, releases of women and girls that have happened so far. But on the other hand of course a social media campaign can't begin to cope with the complexities of peace building and the complexities and the nuances and the difficulties of the needs that communities face. And indeed, there is a danger, of course, that social media campaigns are very binary. They're very black and white, as we've just been discussing in the earlier part of this afternoon, as in the US election. And because, of course, you're distanced from people when you're tweeting or on social media, you're far more aggressive and far more violent. And therefore, it would seem that we're very often losing that social media space to the forces of violence and hatred and intolerance. And so I think that really speaks again to another point that you've raised, Victoria, in our agenda for peace. How is it that we can make sure we're countering those voices of hatred and violence? How is it that we can use the so social media as a voice for peace? And that's something we've been thinking about very much in International Alert as we wrestle exactly with these issues about how do we build a bigger movement for peace? How do we make all our voices much, much louder so that though we're not just talking to each other, we're not just talking to people who agree with us, that we're taking with us many, many more and reaching out much further. And if we're going to do that, 
We're going to need to use things like social media, but how can we do that uh, in a way that remains true to the values of our movement that we've been discussing over the past two days? And I think that's something it would be really interesting to hear from all of you in the, in the discussion afterwards. And if we're, we have to do that, because if we don't do that, I think we're constantly on the back foot as the peace movement. And if you look at how the world spends its money, we spend 250 times more on the military expenditure, and we spend a little tiny P on peace building. So no wonder that we face now more violent conflicts than we have for decades and decades. No wonder that we face the biggest humanitarian crisis of our time if we want to pour 1.6 trillion into the military every year. And let's really then raise our voices to take back some of that to invest it really in putting the case for peace and building key peace in particular with women like Victoria in the forefront. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet, for this extremely uh, insightful uh, speech um, and uh, insight into the work of International Alert. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the work that you do and the work uh, and the experiences and the work that Victoria does. It also makes me reflect on my own work in the DRC and there are a lot of similarities of uh, women's experiences over there. Um, I can think, for instance, of uh, the international emphasis on justice and accountability um, and on formal prosecutions as a way to respond to survivors, whereas you go on the ground and you find that the survivors' needs are different and survivors will talk to you about their need for food, their need for medication, their need for education. And education is a very important uh, issue that uh, survivors speak about, particularly those who are younger age. Um, and so, um, you know, some of the questions is that in the context, of, for instance, uh, of no northern Uganda, how easy is it, for instance, you, you have access to services? How, how, how the situation has improved or not for survivors? For, as a matter, you know, in the, in the DRC, things really haven't improved much apart from, you know, in certain areas such as Bukavu, but still, you know, those are limited to those fortunate victims who can actually access, you know, um, support uh, through Ponzi or other supporting organizations, but the situation on the ground is very much desperate. Um, and while the international community continue to pay attention to justice and accountability as understood by the West, justice as perceived by survivors, which is much broadly concept, is often ignored. And so it always makes me think about what Spivak all said, you know, can the subalterns speak? But when they speak, are we there to listen? So this also brings me to think about the Women, Peace and Security and, um, you know, Resolution 1325 and Resolution 1820, and it has been, you know, more than 15 years since. What has changed for you since then? I mean, at the international level and at the Security Council, we talk about, you know, uh, we need to stop sexual violence in armed conflict, we need to combat sexual violence in armed conflict, we need to involve women in peacemaking, but actually on the ground what has actually changed for women. So I'd like, you know, perhaps you can tell us about that. And then another aspect which I find it also uh, similar to the situation of women in the DRC is the issue of stigma rejection. Um, in my fieldwork research, I realized that actually what hurt women most is when they are rejected by the communities and the you know, the families, and that hurts even more than the experience of violence. And often women who have um, experienced violence, but then they were welcomed into their communities, they are much better off and they are, you know, they feel much better and they are better integrated within the communities. And this is kind of difficult for other women who are not in the same position. So uh, would you like to comment on some of these issues? Would you like to start, Victoria, please? Okay, thank you. On stigma, I must say, like, it is something that you can continue to advocate. What we have done is, as women ourselves, at one point we had programs over the radio where we would go 
we are given a slot. You talk to the people to really understand the situation that having returned from captivity does not mean like we applied to go there or we wanted to go. People should understand. Now that we are back, we suffered enough. Now that we are back, it's important they embrace and then associate with us easily. What would be done, a slot would be given to the community. Different people would call. You find there are not everyone is negative about it. There are those who would call and really talk and advise the general public not to stigmatize, trying to explain the negative aspect of stigma. It, is, it has reduced a bit, but it is something that cannot go. Because even me, Victoria, myself, I'm stigmatized. However, it depends on the level and the situation of somebody. For me right now, even if you talk about me like after here, I don't mind. Yesterday I was on hard talk. There are very many friends calling me. There are those asking, why did you have to talk about what you went through, yet it's no longer there. Then there are those who are appreciating. I don't mind because I've already accepted it. It has reduced a bit, but it cannot go fully. That one I'm very sure whether we do it because somebody will still have to point. You see her there, she's one of the girls who were abducted from St. Mary's. And you know what took place during that time. However, like as time goes on, the statement tries to come down. On issues of like rejection, as ourselves, we also involve the community. There are community dialogues. Here we go and talk to family of some women. There are those who have accepted their children back home. Then there is one in Uganda, there are areas where massacres occurred. You will find a family saying, my daughter, see this mass grave. What do you think people will say if I accept you? Your presence causes pain. At least be somewhere wherever you are, and then we also feel happy. However, what I can say about a situation like that it is the call for the general peace and reconciliation. If community are really talked to, you make them get to understand, like we have been discussing issues, and a lot have came up like in Uganda on the issue of transitional justice policy. Mm. Issues have been discussed. I wish that policy was passed. I wouldn't be regretting if they were implementing it. Because there is a component of truth-telling, component of reparation. We know if you sit in a community, people talk of the truth, what happened to their loved ones. You're given the chance to ask for forgiveness, and the other one will forgive you. We would live in harmony, and then it's something that could really foster the relationship in the community. However, that has not yet taken place. The policy is in place. It has been drafted. We only hear it's about to be submitted to the cabinet. We pray, and I request for all your prayers, that that policy be taken in place, and then something is done to us. Thank you. Thank you. Harriet, would you like to add? Well, I think all these things need investment at a completely another scale. Because I think, well, firstly, conflict is on the rise and therefore the problems facing people caught in the crossfire of conflict is on the rise. And, and we need to invest at an equal and opposite scale if we're going to really support people to come out of conflict and to build peace for the long term and it takes significant investment to provide the level of psychosocial support that people need, as Victoria was saying, and livelihoods. And that's not easy. If we knew how to create livelihoods easily, none of us would have unemployment in any country in the world. So it's incredibly difficult somewhere like northern Uganda, not like northeast Nigeria, to think how are we going to help uh, these women and children all men and boys coming out of conflict and out of abuse to get the support they need, both at a psychosocial level, but also to have livelihoods. And indeed, in northeast Nigeria, at the minute, it is the opposite situation. Until now, so when people have been liberated, they've been put in internally 
displaced people's camps, which are usually the schools of the host community. So firstly, that's caused enormous tension because none of the children of the host communities are going to school at the minute. So now the government has decided, OK, we're going to move people back to their homes. And literally, people are just being put in lorries, screaming, and particularly people who've survived, terrified that when they go back to their communities, they'll be even more subject to stigma. And they're being dumped back in their original villages without the protection and with no means to have livelihoods. And so if we're going to address those kind of situations, we need a level of investment by the international community to really help support those communities and, of course, by the Nigerian government, which, let's face it, is not the poorest government in the world and should be investing far more of its resources also back into building peace. And the statistics show that half of all peace deals fall apart within five years. That's because simply not enough is invested back into helping build that economic underpinning and that kind of community reconciliation that actually Victoria was talking about. And much of which was very interesting progress was made in the Gokacha courts in Rwanda where people did have the chance to come together in order to uh, seek reconciliation and justice and I think there's many models like that that could be rolled out and invested in much more widely. Thank you Harriet. You would like then, to... Just to add on something small, I think it's important in future if you're trying to look into issues of addressing the real issues involves the victims at the grassroots level for a long time like people speak you meet one person and talk to the person, she can't he cannot give you the general overview Meetings are held in good hotels. <laughs> Representatives are there to talk about issues affecting the victims. How do you think such a person will be able to? You're not even sure whether some of those things. So it's my humble request to international bodies, involve the local NGOs, but if you have the time, reach that grassroots community, hear from them. You can design a better strategy on how to help in addressing some of those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you to Harriet. Um, I think I'm going to open the floor for questions because we only have uh, about five minutes left, and I'm sure um, some of you might have some questions. Uh, yeah, please. No question. Only to congratulate Victoria. You make me proud. You're strong. You're beautiful. You're intelligent. You make me proud. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my question is really, uh, what we heard from you is that the participation of people at the grassroots level and hearing their voices. But my experience is that we sometimes do that. That's all good. But do we really act upon what they say? Because it's not just hearing the voices right, it's what you do with that. And do we have the courage and the mindset that we can actually act upon what they tell us to do? Okay, thank you. Why I said it's important to talk to that grassroots person, you may not have something to give me, but even the words you give me can give hope. You can advise. You never know today if you listen to me, any other person, today you are seated in a forum like this. There are people you discuss with who are doing different things. They are able to sell their ideas and you never know opportunities can come out from that. If I sit here and I'm to talk, I know there is a lot of things that women would need. But trust me, nobody can pay your child from P1 up to university. Maybe the person will have lost money. The most important thing is, I wish I could work towards ensuring that at least a few representatives of the women get a source of honey, like how do they start? The love we have for each other if maybe 20, 500 people were doing something, 
we can still contribute towards ensuring that that is circulated towards the others. I'm looking towards designing a program on livelihood, and I will not like lose hope. If I knock your door, you have an organization, a program, university, support one woman. If it is 200 euros, help. If it is 500 Ugandan shilling, help. If you support one woman, you, have done, you will have done something. That one should start doing something and she should not know there will always be something for somebody to give you. Get this, start, work hard and shape your future. That is my next move. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, if we don't have any more comments or questions, I think we're going to end up now. So everybody, can you please applaud Victoria and Harriet? <laughs>